Welcome everyone. Um, those who are um, regular attendees at Grand Rams and those who are, are visiting. Um, but this is Geriatric Medicine Grand Rounds, and we're glad to have you all. We have a really great speaker today. Um, our speaker is one of our faculty members, a professor in our division, Dr. Elizabeth Phelan. Um, she is known for her work in, um, she's a, a physician scientist in our, um, in our division, and she's known for her work in improving primary care for older adults um, in a lot of realms. Um, she is the, she has a lot of different roles. One of her roles is to be the director of our um, Northwest Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Center. But closer to um, what she's gonna be talking about today is she is the founding medical director of our fall prevention clinic at Harborview and has also done quite a bit of research in fall prevention. Um, she has many grants in a lot of different realms, um, lots and lots of manuscripts. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time today to talk about one of your areas of expertise um, in, in falls and what the latest and greatest is. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Kate. That was a very kind introduction. Um, I, uh, I am happy to be here. Um, I enjoy presenting on falls and talk with a lot of different audiences about falls and fall prevention. And I know we're, we're a pretty sophisticated group compared to some um, in terms of kind of ambient knowledge. Um, so um, this hopefully will be a good overview for our fellows on some basics about falls. But um, what I really want to share is, um, as the title suggests, um, things that are uh, current in both the realms of research and, and clinical care. Can everybody see my slides? Yes. Great. Okay. For some reason I have this large your share screening stop screen share in the middle of my slide. So let me just move that. All right. So uh, just disclosures. I do have some salary support from uh, the CDC on projects that relate to, to uh, falls and um, they're listed here. So just a quick um, overview here of where we're gonna go today. So I'll start with just some fundamentals about falls, just like I said, to make sure we're all kind of on the same page about the epidemiology and and what is what is known about falls and uh, how they occur and so forth, um, and then jump into clinical updates, um, highlighting a, a guideline that came out uh, just about a year ago, um, early September 2022, um, produced um, by an international group called the World. It's called the Global Falls Guideline or the World Falls Guideline and look at some updates to the STEADY initiative um, from the CDC's Injury uh, Prevention Center, and then I'll go over some research uh, updates. So in terms of my objectives for today, um, for again, kind of gearing our presentations for grand rounds are supposed to be geared towards our fellows, at least that's my always been my understanding. So after today's presentation, um, in particular, I hope fellows will be able to, to develop their own brief chalk talk on falls um, and fall prevention. Uh, and two, that any attendees um, after listening will be able to discuss falls and their prevention using an age-friendly person-centered approach, apply recommendations from that World Falls Guideline that I just mentioned uh, and I'll highlight some of the new areas uh, that that guideline covers, uh, which include a couple of things I've pointed out here, uh, i.e. dementia and Parkinson's disease. And then uh, also attendees should be able to demonstrate familiarity with recent falls research. And our land acknowledgement, always very important um, to take a moment for this. Uh, I just wanna acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples whose land we're on today. Um, and this is a really um, important uh, to our values of inclusion. We wanna make visible and honor our relationship with those uh, tribes and bands of the Coast Salish peoples.
So looking at fundamentals of falls, fall prevention. First, I've used this uh, version of this slide for many years. Um, it always gets some kind of a chuckle for reasons I don't understand, um, but this is the definition of an outpatient fall coming to rest unintentionally on the ground or lower level. Uh, this um, definition is a little different just so folks in the weeds of uh, geriatric medicine care in the hospital um, uh, and also in primary care uh, would appreciate to understand that it's different from the definition for in hospital falls. Um, so this definition for outpatient falls excludes overwhelming events um, due to an acute uh, event, health event, like a seizure or a stroke, or any kind of external event, such as a person being knocked over in a crowd or uh, pushed or, or shoved in an assault, for example. So what do we know about the epidemiology of falls? So falls are really common. Um, they are probably the most common um, syndrome affecting uh, aging individuals with an uh, annual incidence of one in three for older adults um, living in the community. And that actually is uh, even higher for people who are in their 80 plus, so the octogenarian and beyond age range. Uh, and for people who are living in a skilled nursing facility, uh, one in two uh, will have a fall each year. People with cognitive impairment, including dementia, uh, also in that same one in two annual uh, incidence bracket. And why do we care about falls? Well, there's lots of reasons we care um, and why people have worked for so many years and are still working to try to figure out strategies to reduce a person's falls, uh, fall frequency, risk of falls, et cetera. It's because, first of all, falls are really responsible for the majority of serious injuries that we see, um, dwarfing all other causes of, of unintentional injuries in the older population. And the care for those injuries is, is, is extremely costly to our society. The U.S. Um, uh, cost estimates um, that are still the most current that we have um, suggest that care for fall injuries is in excess of $50 billion annually. And really important for us as clinicians uh, taking care of uh, uh, people um, in many different contexts is to recognize that this is not a problem that people talk with their healthcare providers about on a regular basis. Uh, statistics um, suggest, uh, CDC data suggests that only about, um, you know, somewhere around a little bit less than 50% of people will talk with their healthcare providers about falls, uh, even if they've been experiencing multiple falls. And the other um, kind of key piece of epidemiology is to understand that uh, this is becoming an in increasingly expansive problem uh, in this uh, band here that's, uh, again, uh, CDC data. You can see that numbers of events are increasing and projected to continue to increase through 2030. Uh, both in terms of the numbers, sheer numbers of falls experienced by aging individuals and the number of injuries um, that will be occurring <clears throat> as a result of those falls. And then looking at, you can look at data by state and our, uh, you know, we really do as a state, uh, Washington state uh, is really squarely in the, the realm of about one in three um, falls on an annual basis. And that amounts to a little bit under 400,000 people uh, in, in Washington state alone with a death rate that isn't the highest in the nation, um, but um, is, is uh, substantial. And because of um, that, you'll see um, some priorities um, in a minute or from the public health world around trying to reduce that. Uh, rate. And this rate, uh, this is data from uh, the Whiskers database um, showing data through 2021, which is the most recent data that are available on fall death rates, that this rate is, is rising. 
there are some disparities um, that are important to be aware of uh, with regard to falls. For, for example, uh, disparities by subgroups of older age. So those who are over 85 are more likely to fall uh, compared to the young, what we call the young, old, and the old. Uh, so the 65 to 74 and the 75 to 84 age groups. Men are actually more likely to die from a fall and people have um, some con conjectured some explanations for that and certainly can talk about that. Um, and by the way, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, I can't see the chat right now, but uh, maybe Kate, if you or someone um, could help monitor that, that'd be great. Um, I'm gonna keep an eye on it. Thanks. Um, women are more likely to have uh, non-fatal falls um, and more likely to experience injuries due to falls. And uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives have a higher incidence of both falls and fall injuries compared to other uh, races. And with regard to rurality, uh, it seems that the uh, younger old, so the age 65 to 74 age groups, experience more falls compared to their urban counterparts. So as I mentioned, a public health uh, response, you, you're all probably familiar with the healthy people objectives and, and uh, efforts that they produce about every decade, a healthy people report with health-related objectives for uh, across the across the spectrum of of health conditions and this is the objective for the uh measure of reducing fall related deaths among older adults in the most recent the 2030 healthy people so the death rates across the us um as you can see are listed here uh, the target death rate um is 63 per 100,000 um in over the next decade. And um, so the, this is, you know, there there is work to be done uh, around reducing deaths. And of course, that's not all we care about, but um, this is a this is the public health priority around falls uh, as it as it currently stands. So why do people have falls? Why do they occur? Falls, I use this um, image with patients all the time um, in clinic to help them understand that falls are not a purely, uh, a pure accident, um, that that they occur to, in fact, to, to a combination of uh, risk factors. And we can think about those risk factors in different ways. We can break those up into what are called intrinsic and extrinsic or individual level and environmental level risk factors. And it takes, for people who are falling repeatedly, it takes a combination of these risk factors um, all coming together uh, to lead to that fall event. And over the years, guidelines have summarized both um, expert opinion as well as uh, current evidence to produce recommendations for clinical practice. Um, the most recent guidelines from the AGS um, are actually, I refer to them as historical now because they uh, were published in 2011. Uh, the CDC's study initiative is based on those guidelines. Um, and then the 20, it, time flies, the last time the US Preventive Services Task Force actually uh, published an update uh, was back in 2018. Um, so these this this slide summarizes the current those current guide those guidelines and you can consider them current or not they're the most let's say they're the most recent um, national guidelines uh, from the study initiative um, this is just a screenshot here of what are electronic medical records um, within uh, the UW medicine system has done as far as taking the three key screening questions uh, from the, the steady initiative screening algorithm uh, and essentially translated that into an epic uh, set of questions. And these, just so everybody's aware, these are um, 
available for medical assistance at check-in and uh we do in uh, the Falls Clinic have have this tracked um, by our medical assistants, but this happens uh, across um, UW um, widely now, um, use of these three questions for Falls screening um, because of that, that EMR-based screening uh, set. And this is a schematic just summarizing the uh, those guidelines, uh, strategy for fall screening risk assessment and management. So start, so screening for falls is very simple. Um, there's no test to do. Um, it's asking these questions, the screening questions and determining if people have had one or zero falls, uh, and then asking, you can ask about gait or balance problems. The guidelines actually suggest that you you, you assess, do some assessment for gait and balance. Um, we can talk about that as well, but um, D and Kay Ritchie and I have a paper that has um, uh, described that self-report of gait and balance problems correlates very well with performance-based measures. Uh, and so, especially since COVID and doing remote visits, we can, we can feel pretty confident that just asking uh, for a person's perspective do they feel unsteady when walking, uh, for example, um, that that's pretty reliable uh, to decide, you know, which path, which which part of this algorithm you're going to go down based on that and the count of falls. So for somebody who's had zero to one falls, it, that was kind of a give me, you know, maybe there isn't an issue. Um, <clears throat> we don't have a, a, a sort of a pattern established. Uh, where people are falling, what we call repeatedly, which uh, is defined as two or more falls in, in the prior 12 months. Those people, we still want to do some preventive counseling for, and that entails education about risk factors, especially ones that are modifiable, and recommending for all of those individuals uh, a routine strength and balance program of exercise. Um, most people who fall, uh, and most older adults, in fact, do nothing for balance. I think about 3% um, is the statistic that practice balance exercises on a regular basis. So this is really important message. Primary, pre primary care prevent preventive efforts um, should, should strongly uh, encourage this as, as the approach. So for people who fall into that other the right hand side of this algorithm. So they've fallen, they've either fallen a couple of times in the past year, or if they've ever sought medical attention, even if it's just for a single fall, or they have a problem, endorsed problem or observed problem with gait or balance, that's where that comprehensive fall risk assessment um, uh, is recommended. And what do we know about the benefits of that assessment, that so called multifactorial fall risk assessment? These are the uh, outcomes that have been examined in uh, various and sundry clinical trials uh, showing that uh, the benefits pertain to uh, fall-related outcomes and also just in terms of more uh, uh, a kind of a broader look at, at outcomes. Physical functioning is improved, fall self-efficacy, uh, meaning a person's confidence or degree thereof to perform their daily activities um, without being concerned about falling, quality of life, uh, all those outcomes appear to have uh, uh, been touched and improved by, by that multifactorial approach. And uh, uh, the study by Tenetti, um, show that this is probably a cost-effective um, uh, intervention uh, given uh, the high cost of fall injuries. Um, and that was a quasi-experimental uh, study uh, design. So uh, I say probably, but um, uh, it's the best evidence we have around costs. And then with regard to exercise as a single intervention, and again, this is the balance and strength training exercises practice on a, a routine basis. This does have a, uh, uh, a benefit in reducing the risk of falling as well as uh, affecting other important measures such as injurious falls um, very solidly, repeatedly studies have shown impact on injurious falls 
um, which is um, which is notable. And this is old um, research now, um, but this was one of our fellows um, when I was a junior faculty, um, who's now at uh, the ABIM, I believe, Miguel Paniagua, who many of you have probably met at AGS meetings. Um, this was his scholarly project from uh, his second year of fellowship. Uh, we talked about how we were seeing all these people in, you know, in the hospital who had fall injury, and we wondered whether or not they had actually had any care for falls specifically when they showed up in the emergency room. So this is a study that uh, he conducted through chart review at um, our Harborview ER um, with the blessing of Dr. Copas at the time, and the key findings were we confirmed that a fall's history was rarely uh, obtained, fall risk factors um, were not identified, and most of the patients that were seen uh, had appointments scheduled only for follow-up of their fall-related injury if there, there had been an injury, but no preventive care for falls. So this was really the impetus for um, the establishment of, of our fall prevention clinic back in, um, way back in 2005. So that's the fundamentals of falls. Um, any questions about any of that before we switch gears and talk about uh, some of the uh, clinical updates I wanted to share? So again, pretty basic stuff, but I think it, it's good to have that foundation um, for every everybody um, in our um, in our work um, that we do with older adults. So let's look now at the World Falls Guideline. As I mentioned, this was published just about a year ago in Age and Aging. And uh, it was a, a pretty massive undertaking, actually. Um, I think I just went forward a slide too, too soon. Um, this was an, a, really an international effort. Um, and there was, prior to the publication of the guideline, uh, many of the same individuals worked on a systematic review uh, to update the evidence, which essentially, as I, I showed you, hadn't been updated for uh, at least five years. And um, in the case of the AGS guideline, um, even, even longer. So uh, working groups were formed, they identified gaps and, and developed a set of preliminary recommendations. And then a Delphi process was used um, to come up with the final recommendations. And the goals of this guideline listed here um, were really trying to look to, to the prior evidence, but update it and with a focus on certain topics that had not been covered in prior guidelines. Uh, and I've listed those areas here. So, and I will show you uh, some of the recommendations um, specific to these uh, new areas of focus um, in just a couple minutes. Notably, and, and I think really impressively, um, despite the, the mammoth size of, of this uh, effort, there was also attention paid to incorporating the the patient and the uh, patient's family's perspective. So they they really elicited um, a response from um, people beyond just experts in the field. The AGS commentary, um, uh, there will be a commentary uh, published in JAGS. Um, I'm not exactly sure what our, our current timeline for publication of that is. It's um, it's in preparation at this time still. Uh, I think it's um, it probably is going to a the AGS um, uh, for review, but it's been something that a group of, of folks in, working in the field have been, um, including myself, have been working on since last winter. Um, so the AGS made a decision to not uh, update its own guideline, um, but in, because of, of this guideline uh, to provide a commentary with a, uh, the goal of trying to 
explicate what's relevant to the US population in this in, in this new guideline. So um, the next couple of slides are just going to try to summarize and uh, the guideline is, is dense, but I'm, I've tried to summarize here what are some of the new things that um, where this guideline differs from from prior uh, guidelines. So in terms of assessment, um, they've become a little bit more specific in terms of some of the recommendations. So for um, many of us, we're familiar with using uh, timed up and go as a as a measure of of uh, fall risk. This guideline actually recommends gate speed uh, to uh, as a predictor of fall risk. Uh, there certainly is plenty of evidence um, to to justify that recommendation. Um, and then in terms of assessment of medications that increase fall risk, the guideline recommends using a validated tool. Uh, I'll show you the one that uh, in a subsequent slide uh, called Stop Fall, which is the one that they, they specify as an example of a validated tool. They list a, a number of other validated tools as well. Um, they also have, I wouldn't say have gone back to, but um, they are, uh, they're categorizing risk into three buckets, low, intermediate, and high risk of falls. Um, and that is different um, than what the current C CDC, anyway, the study uh, algorithm uh, does. And they recommend assessing um, and distinguishing risk low versus intermediate based on questions about gait or balance problems. They also have some new features um, that they have focused on that can be used as indicators of high fall risk. Um, those include frailty, uh, inability to get up after a fall without help, and uh, anyone who may have uh, suspected or witnessed loss of consciousness. <clears throat> um, and tying into that patient-centeredness of this guideline, uh, they emphasize for the first time um, the importance of eliciting older um, folks' perceptions of falls um, and also their goals and priorities. So this really does um, mesh really nicely with our uh, what matters of our age-friendly approach to care of older adults, where we do try to elicit those, um, those perceptions. Uh, it, Really the summary point about home technologies and the use of, of digital technology in general um, is that uh, that where they landed with this is that smart home technologies hold promise but need further testing and that wearable devices may increase participation if they're used in the context of exercise programs. So this is uh, the stop fall that uh, example uh, validated uh, fall risk increasing drug tool identifier. Um, this is a, a slide excerpted from the article uh, published in Age and Aging describing how this stop fall tool was developed and validated. And it shows, the figure shows the 14 classes of, of medications that through this consensus-based process um, that was uh, applied to decide on what recommendations um, and which classes of medicine would be considered fall risk increasing. Uh, these are the final after three rounds of, of uh, review by a panel of experts in, in pharmacy and uh, geriatrics care. Um, these are the 14 classes that were agreed upon. So it's a it's a uh, it was a pretty rigorous um, process. They looked at uh, a lot of a lot of studies, um, and the the upshot is that there were lots of classes. In fact, more classes where there was no consensus. Um, but this is at any rate a, a tool that's available um, and. Uh, can be used if um, you know people want to use a structured tool as the guideline recommends for the purpose of 
medication assessment. Within the realm of fall risk assessment, and again, this gets into when people are high risk uh, as defined either by this guideline or um, if you just think back to that algorithm where um, I showed you the kind of the steady and AGS based algorithm, the high risk was that right hand side of, of the, the algorithm. Uh, the, the new things that, that are suggested to be included as part of a multifactorial fall risk assessment are listed here. Um, again, an emphasis on use of a structured tool um, to assess uh, concerns about falling. And the guideline did specify that uh, it's recommended um, to avoid the term fear of falling or ask patients if they're afraid of falling, uh, that patients preferred to be asked about whether they had concerns about falling. So some new language is recommended uh, around uh, how we talk with patients about this form of anxiety um, that's related to uh, falls. Um, my takeaway on this um, editorializing for just a moment here is these, this was very reassuring to me that um, having spent many years, um, and I'm sure Jenny and Kay and others who've worked in doing um, uh, multifactorial risk assessments can attest, we've been doing for many years um, the uh, all assessments of all these domains that are listed here. Uh, but again, this is new. Um, this, you know, it, it was developed as out of clinical experience um, and added over time um, to our risk assessments in, in the falls clinic, but now um, there is actual evidence here that's been called um, and, um, and supports that approach. So then a, a fair amount of the guideline gets into condition specific recommendations. Uh, and so I've called out the ones that I think are really um, the key recommendations for specific population subgroups of older adults. So first for people with mild cognitive impairment or dementia, uh, really the literature um, continues to only um, support um, exercise. Um, there is a recommendation, and I think this is forward-looking again, um, um, to involve care partners as part of uh, fall risk reduction. Although there currently are no trials, um, and you'll, I'll show you some formative research that uh, I've been collaborating on uh, around looking at, you know, the area of care partner involvement in fall risk reduction, specifically for people with cognitive impairment and dementia. Uh, but needless to say that those are those are the um, really the only recommendations that um, pertain to to cognitive impairment for Parkinson's disease. Again, carrying on with that theme of using a structured tool, a validated tool, uh, there is a, a a tool that's cited in this guideline uh, that's specific to Parkinson's, um, and it's a, it's a self report, so a short um, three risk factor screening tool asks about, for example, uh, freezing of gait and um, self-perception of gait speed compared to other older adults uh, from the perspective of the person with Parkinson's. So it's, it's, um, it, it is a condition-specific risk uh, factor uh, screening tool. Uh, and the citation is there for anyone who's interested to look further at that. Uh, for folks with established Parkinson's disease, the other recommendations include optimizing medications to um, maximize motor function, minimize side effects of those medications uh, that are Parkinson's disease specific. For early disease to offer multi-domain interventions based on identified fall risk factors. Again, this is what um, we, we would do if somebody um, saw us with Parkinson's in the falls clinic. And for those who have advanced disease, there is evidence that individualized supervised exercise training by um, specially trained physical therapists um, does in, uh, is effective in uh, reducing fall risk. And the same 
a uh, recommendation was made for uh, the other groups listed here, people who are post-stroke and post-hip fracture. And as I mentioned a bit ago, there's a three-tier uh, risk stratification and an, an actual algorithm that calls us out within the guideline. Uh, so low, intermediate, and high risk. Uh, and with, you know, recommendations that are, are somewhat different from the ones that I showed you on the algorithm um, that uh, uh, a few minutes ago about primary prevention, uh, they add physical activity, which is, is a general, rec you know, generally recommended um, uh, primary prevention for all older adults, um, not necessarily specific to uh, reducing fall risk, however, so that was, that's, somewhat new, continuing to recommend strength and balance exercise, and they specified twice weekly, and then um, fall risk or fracture risk management rather. Um, supervised exercise, which is essentially exercise either done in a class or uh, or one-on-one -on -one with a physical therapist um, is, is a recommendation in addition for those at intermediate risk and then for the high risk that multifactorial risk assessment, shared decision making, incorporating patient values, and using um, those um, the perspectives of of that older adult and care partner uh, to to um, to guide care plans, and also um, uh, including including that uh, extending that recommendation to people with cognitive impairment. So that's a quick walk through a very dense guideline. And now I'm gonna just give you uh, a little bit of a lighter, <laughs> um, more even more uh, kind of practical uh, perspective on some new resources. So I hope that everyone, our fellows included, um, are somewhat familiar with the studies, uh, study initiative. There's uh, lots of materials on their uh, website if you just Google steady and falls, uh, steady spelled with an I, of course, it stands for stopping elderly accidents, death and injuries and in older adults. Um, and so what I'm highlighting here in the next few slides is, is what's been added recently. Uh, so for those of you who uh, are familiar with what's been there, uh, the CDC is continuing to uh, expand grow uh, the suite of materials and the, the areas of emphasis um, available. And it's really all intended to guide clinical practice, um, which is somewhat different when you think about the CDC. And, you know, when you think of CDC and COVID, you think of public health. Uh, and so the to the injury center's credit, they really recognized uh, early on that this needed to happen in clinical practice. So the first uh, new add to their suite of materials is something called the Coordinated Care Plan. Uh, this was published online in 2021, and it was developed with the input of uh, a number of people who were experts, who are experts in the field uh, of falls, and uh, and also some early adopters of STEADY. So people who really were in, in you know, health system, uh, higher level management, um, for example, out of New York State, where um, United Healthcare really was, you know, one of the early adopters of STEADY. And um, in this whole purpose of this coordinated, coordinated care plan is to um, help practices uh, implement and evaluate any clinical fall prevention program uh, that they may develop based on STEADY. This is a fairly recent add also to their suite of materials. This is um, best practices for uh, for the hospital setting. Uh, and it was developed based on a research study that was done at UCSF and really emphasizes how to prevent falls both during hospitalization and thereafter. Uh, so it 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 highlights um, uh, that work and makes it, you know, a practical um, translation of of what they did in the UCSF um, approach uh, in the hospital. 
And a new feature too is this uh, steady RX guide. So this is geared towards community pharmacists. Again, um, to CDC's credit, um, with input from people who work in the field, they also recognize that pharmacists have a key role to play in fall prevention. And uh, so this guide was developed to support community-based pharmacists in that role. And this is just an algorithm um, that shows how uh, the types of tools that are available for uh, pharmacists who, who want to participate in, in this and, and uh, work with their patients on fall risk screening and management. And uh, the the approach um, that CDC is trying to uh, support around medication review, uh, in, in addition to research um, that is ongoing, and I'll highlight some of some of those studies in uh, a little bit. They've developed some other tools that have to do that are specific to medication uh, screening for medications that may increase fall risk, and they use this safe uh, framework, screen, assess, formulate, and educate uh, to help uh, remind people uh, what to wh what are the different steps in terms of uh, medication review and, and management for fall prevention. <clears throat> okay, so that those are the clinical updates. And now I'm gonna, in the last 10 minutes here, I'll try to leave about five minutes for questions, um, go through the research updates, uh, these are selected um, out of what I kind of deem of interest to our group. Um, and so the ones, uh, the different updates, angles that, that I'll focus on are listed here. So um, first, emerging fall risk factors, um, trials of deprescribing, uh, trials of study in primary care and skilled nursing facilities, and uh, an, an a updated uh, U.S. Preventive mm -hmm. Services Task Force review, systematic review, which I'll, uh, I can share a little bit about. And then if we have time, we'll go through the formative research I mentioned on the role of dementia care partners in fall prevention. So important to be aware, uh, I think for us is, uh, you know, what are, what, what is current work being done in the area of risk factors beyond the ones that have already become well-established, well-entrenched as being uh, contributors to falls. So one of those is alcohol consumption. Um, and the, you know, I, I guess, I don't know if others have noticed this, but having been on MedG in the past couple of years, I've observed um, that we are seeing more and more older adults uh, who come in with a serious fall injury and, and they do have um, so-called alcohol on board. So the annual rate uh, of ED visits um, to kind of corroborate that observation in the in that clinical setting in which I practice, um, that annual rate of falls for, uh, or annual rate of ED visits, excuse me, for alcohol associated falls has been found um, to be on the increase. And interestingly, um, falls um, with alcohol use um, that present for ED care are more likely to involve traumatic brain injuries than uh, falls um, in the absence of, of that use. So just some touch points there um, for us to be aware of. Uh, an, an area that you know we, we, we should consider for, for counseling, for example. Um, peripheral neuropathy, um, again, very interesting to, to see new studies coming out about that as being a risk factor for falls. Um, we, we know it's really common um, in falls clinic. We see um, people quite frequently with diabetes and peripheral neuropathy. We have a clinically driven approach um, to counseling folks, but um, it, it, it is a, it, it for those of us who worked in the clinic, it's been very apparent for a long time that this is a risk factor that it, it does contribute to falls. And 
Um, you know, it is a risk factor. We don't have any current trial data about management of that specifically looked at this as a risk factor, but uh, we at least do have some recent epi data uh, confirming what, what we've observed um, for years, which is it is an independent risk factors for falls and fractures. Pain. Um, so um, this is also a literature that has been, um, I would say it's not nascent at this point, uh, like uh, the alcohol and the peripheral neuropathy literature, but uh, certainly studies have, a number of study, studies have confirmed uh, the findings um, that I think perhaps Suzanne Levely was one of the first to publish on off of the um, uh, her her Boston cohort study um, in JAMA that both multi-site pain uh, or pain uh, that's severe in a single location increases the risk of falls. And this more recent study um, by Kai et al. Um, from 2021 also showed that it increased the risk of injurious falls. I also wanted to highlight um, Yanjin Zhao, um, my collaborator um, that I mentioned in work looking at um, developing care partner driven interventions to reduce falls among people with cognitive impairment here. She um, has some uh, interesting work that looks at pain and uh, what's called fall worry uh, within the NHATS uh, database um, in people with cognitive impairment and importantly, uh, you know, the NHAT study is a is an ongoing cohort study. Questions are administered, um, survey questions are administered to people with cognitive impairment. Um, uh, if they are unable to answer them, then a proxy answers. One of the key findings from her study that I think is is quite interesting is that uh, both pain and fall worry. Um, could be elicited um, from people directly, um, those with cognitive impairment, um, and that they're they're frequently endorsed, frequently experienced, um, in other words. And then uh, kind of a similar finding for those without cognitive impairment, um, um, where uh, the increased number of sites of pain, so the greater number of pain sites was associated in her analyses with activity limiting fall worry. Um, so, so important to understand that we do need to address pain uh, as part of our uh, comprehensive care uh, to reduce fall risk. And then social isolation. Um, when I presented this um, uh, talk in, at Stanford in June, um, uh, got the question about what, are, what is known about so, social isolation? Um, is there any literature on that? And um, in fact, there, there is. Um, social isolation also seems to be associated with falls, although the, um, the strength of the association is, um, is fairly weak. Now the, the de-prescribing trials, uh, looking at those for a minute, and th this is summarized uh, in a nutshell here, uh, we're wrapping up our trial and um, working on our main outcomes manuscript. There were two other grantees, Iowa and UNC. Uh, these trials have been going on for um, about four years now. Uh, and the purpose of the funding was to examine um, at, de-prescribing strategies uh, and whether or not those are effective to reduce falls. Um, our, all of our trials, the three grantees, we were all uh, health system embedded, health system partnered um, uh, for our intervention delivery. Um, I, I have not seen publications from either of the other two sites describing their their uh, falls outcomes. Um, our paper is slated to be submitted. Um, we're planning to submit it uh, probably, hopefully by the end of, of uh, this upcoming month. And as a result of these trials, there are going to be new products um, and, and uh, materials added to the steady um, initiative. So materials that were used in the trials um, 
um, will will become available. And um, so keep an eye out for those things. Um, I won't say more about that right now, but um, we have some useful, I think, patient empowerment brochures, for example, um, to help support um, patients' um, self-efficacy to um, de-prescribe. Study effectiveness trials. So this is these are basically trials of implementing study in primary care. The study options trial being done, uh, actually it's completed now, um, was a randomized quality improvement trial testing the full study protocol um, versus uh, usual care. And um, because it was conducted during COVID, uh, they pivoted to telemedicine delivery um, as an option. Those results and papers, um, both on the process and outcomes, um, are in preparation. Uh, hopefully, they'll be out um, within the next six months. And then uh, a local study here, um, the steady sniff trial that I'm involved with is um, uh, being led by Hillary Thompson, a PI from the uh, UW School of Nursing. And the goal of this is to uh, adapt the steady um, materials for use in long-term care and to test its feasibility and acceptability um, within long-term care settings. So we are uh, identifying potential sites at this point uh, for that pilot test. Uh, the adaptation work is has been the focus thus far. So we'll be moving into the pilot phase um, this upcoming year, 2024. Lastly, um, since I have one more minute before it's 8.55, this is um, uh, Yan Jin Zhao's, again, uh, uh, PhD um, graduate, recent graduate from the School of Social Work here. I was on her dissertation committee. She's now an assistant professor at uh, University of Texas at Austin. Really, her goal is to develop a care partner um, uh, driven intervention, as I mentioned, to prevent falls among uh, older people with dementia. Uh, there are, as I said too before, very few interventions uh, that have been found to, to prevent falls in um, people with dementia, um, which is why that World Falls Guideline suggests exercise, because there is evidence for that. Um, uh, at this point, that's really the only evidence we have. Uh, and so um, Yan Jin worked in, uh, prior to her, her uh, social work degree, uh, had came to me, uh, she was getting started in her PhD and she had some clinical um, intuition about how care partners really could take a lead in managing fall risk um, in, in people who uh, they were caring for with dementia. Um, but really we don't know much if anything about what they do, how they approach this, how they think about this and um, you know, if any of what they do might might be relevant. So uh, we've been uh, doing, uh, conducting a series of studies, uh, gathering formative um, data to inform an intervention. And I'll, I'll stop there. Um, so summary um, here, uh, Exercise is really critical if people are going to do one single thing and it has to improve balance um, to be effective to reduce falls and fall injury risk. That multifactorial approach is effective if, if there's ongoing follow-up and appropriate um, uh, for people at high risk. We have limited data on effective interventions, as I said, and just now for older people with dementia. So watch for those care partner focused interventions coming down the pike in the future. And then uh, also watch for that AGS commentary that I mentioned um, that will translate the World Fall Guide, Falls Guideline for US um, audiences, the results of those deep prescribing trials and also the, the two study trials I highlighted. Uh, I would love to get your feedback. If you could use this QR code for that purpose, I'll leave this up for a few minutes. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days and lives um, to, to be here today. Well, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. I really appreciated hearing all of those updates. There are a lot of comments in the chat and we only have about three minutes left, so we won't be able to get through all of them, but there was a question about whether Medicare covers um, some of the fall prevention strategies that you mentioned. 
Uh, well, so supervised exercise in physical therapy, absolutely. Um, uh, the, you know, certainly like um, false screening, uh, you can code. So if you're doing routine, you know, visits, either primary care or other visits, and you're spending time counseling patients, you, you can code for uh, things like, um, you know, medications, high risk medications, there are multiple billing codes that can be used that are specific for some of those risk factors. So things I commonly, um, you know, codes I commonly use are things like balance impairment and um, um, difficulty walking, dependent on walker for mobility, high risk medication use, orthostatic hypotension. Um, yeah, so our, our, our visits can be, can call out all of those risk factors um, and, and reflect the complexity. Great, thank you. And um, Dr. K. Ritchie put a lot of great comments in the chat about all that is happening at the, the VA with fall prevention and some of her thoughts. So everyone should read through those. I don't think we'll have time to go through all of them since it's 8.59, um, but thank you, K., for um, putting all of that in the chat. Um, it's there's a lot happening over at the VA and you have some really good comments to share. We have a division meeting on a different Zoom link. So for those of you who are members of our division, please look for your separate Zoom link to switch over. And for applicants who joined us today, you'll stay on this link and we'll get you and Shanitra will get you to the right place. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Phelan, for this uh, presentation. It is much needed and I'm glad it's recorded so that we can refer back to it um, and others who couldn't join us today can see it. So thank you so much. I would love to see the chat too. So um, we'll see if um, there's a way for us to download um, to download the chat. I'll have uh, it. I'll have I, it and I can send it out. Okay, that would be great because if there's any other questions that um, people wanted to ask that they didn't get a chance, I'm happy to, to look at that. And if you could just give